How about we start with some version history again? What do we have this time? The Meteor Grunt theme. In the present day, it sounds like this. But when I first played this game, again, episode 14 era, it was this one. That sure kicked off the villain group in a big way, maybe a bit too big. This is the Rocket Grunt theme from Heart Gold and Soul Silver, remixed by Glitch X City. It's certain that Amethyst's ultimate goal for Meteor was not open, loud adversity, but much more mysterious, clandestine sabotage. The Rocket Grunt theme, though badass and much more memorable than the present track, could get a bit tiring since you're going to be fighting grunts a lot. Johto Legendary Beast Remix version 3 by the same artist and hailing from the same games can sell the darker tone for Meteor much better while being more palatable to hearing frequently. Though, in a video like this, maybe you'll hear them interchangeably. We return to the story when... right. There's something we need to go get. Return to the barrel gym and enter the secret room. Inside, unlike before, you will find an item on the floor. A silver ring. Why take a precious memento like this? Well, it can help us gather the other members that remain in this family. Those being the Pokemon family members. Cory released his team at the end of the previous episode, and you can find them, though only one at this time. Head down into the Underroot in Rotocrine, and go all the way to the bottom to this water source. You'll find Cory's Skrelp drinking from the pool, who sees the ring and appears obedient. We can adopt the Skrelp without issue. There are a few other things we should take care of in Beryl and Jasper. First, head back to the library to find this Gothitelle who telepathically communicates with you, denoted by the dashes bookending her text. She requests we help her clean up the library of all the detritus. This means picking up any non-stacked books and all of the glass and paper. Yeah, just stand on top of the glass and pick it up with your bare hands. Metal. Go throughout the library and vacuum every scrap out of place and return to the Gothitelle, who will be pleased that you helped her and her daughters. She will reward you with a soul candle something we will imminently go use. Though, she thinks we should use it for something else. At the end of hell lies nothingness. Uh, also, go talk to this excited Gothita, who apparently wants to travel with us. When you talk to the mother about this, it appears that she only bids us to watch over her, saying that neither life here nor out there are very suitable for the child. Let's go somewhere a little more cheery. Okay, whatever. Let's use this soul candle. If you talk to this pumpkin at night, you'll discover what ghost the news story from last episode was talking about. Pumpkaboo. You can capture that, of course, but you'll also quickly notice that this cemetery is up on a mountain, thus enabling us to analyze its field effect of the same name. Mountain, which will feature much more frequently later in the game, interestingly shows up now. Mountain is a fairly straightforward field, being the home turf for the flying type. Let's go over it. First, rock and flying type moves both increase in power by 50%, and harsh sunlight will last for 8 turns. Aerolate will increase the damage boost of affected moves from 20% to 50%. Gale Wings goes back to its original form, being always on, if there are strong winds. Long Reach boosts the damage dealt by the bearer by 50%, fuck you Fern. These moves will raise in power by 50%, while these moves will do so in strong winds. Yes, Gust is a special flying move, so it does get the 50% boost twice, and it gets the original flying boost for the field, making it base 135 power, holy. Thunder never misses, and Tailwind will last 6 turns. Tailwind is also one of the ways you can make strong winds. Nature power becomes rock slide, oh god. Camo becomes rock. Secret power may cause flinching. A Telluric Seed raises attack by two stages and lowers accuracy one stage. And that's all. It's a pretty lean list of changes, though it can make some Pokemon very threatening. Of course, Talonflame doesn't need any help, but a Tailwinded Talonflame becomes ridiculous here. Besides that, 
rock moves get a strong increase, and even random things like thunder just being 165 power and never missing can take you by surprise. Speaking of that, though flying is well suited on this field, thunder will be a strong counter since you should have both the defensive and offensive advantage. Though, there is a caveat to this that we'll explain later. Besides that though, not a lot changes, especially right now. You're still in the early game and you aren't likely to see many of those moves. However, Mountain does get a pretty outsized gulf between its difficulty and depth, since its value to the right teams will greatly increase the longer you play. Depth 3. Difficulty 6. Returning south to Jasper Ward, you may go towards the Pokemon Center or otherwise down this street and find a child trapped by three Pokemon. That's actually the same child we saved from the Drift Loon last episode. Approach the altercation, which gets the attention of the Scolipede as it turns to attack you instead. Seeing as how they are bug type, I lead with Camera up since he's stronger than Growlithe. Turns out this was a good decision because the first opponent out, Venipede 1, is a level higher than him. Since nearly everything in this game is going to be faster than Camerupt anyway, the bug outspeeds to hit me with Toxic, what a bastard. However, the Venipede can't survive a lava plume from the poisoned camel. This causes the leader of the bullies to avenge, Scolipede, at level 42. Now that's a problem. And then he scores a crit with Steamroller on the Toxified Camel, though Camerupt is still going strong. Better still, his Anger Point, an ability I'm very on the fence about, goes off and his attack is maximized. It's too bad I went for Lava Plume again instead of Rock Slide, but I end up scorching away half the Scolipede and burning it. The burn is probably why Camerupt survives a subsequent Steamroller, who I repay with a maximized attack Rock Slide to take it out. Amazingly, the toxic damage leaves me on exactly one, so I let Camerupt stay out to hopefully finish it. Unfortunately, Venipede 2 is also faster, so Camerupt dies to a Bug Bite. In his place, I now send Growlithe, who bites the bug with fire twice, tanking the poison tails without getting poisoned. The three bugs skitter away and leave the child unharmed. The child thanks us profusely and tells us they can make it home safely, which as a reminder is in the Lapis Ward. We will head there soon. Oh, by the way, remember two episodes ago when I mentioned this about Pokemon-led trainer battles? Pokemon in these battles aren't catchable. Take note of what music is playing to know for sure. If it's trainer battle music, don't attempt to throw a ball. I was completely wrong about the music, as evidenced by this battle. The wild music is playing in this fight, but you cannot catch any of these Pokémon. So instead, take this much better advice. Only try to catch it if the battle starts by saying, a wild blah 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 appeared, and not super cool Pokémon you'd love to catch wants to battle. Now let's take a moment to do something I know I didn't do in my completed playthrough as soon as it was offered. Last episode we got a Growlithe from the police, the one that was from the officer that didn't make it. It turns out that one of the other officers, the one that was in the overturned building cornered by the meteor, had his Growlithe stolen by that grunt. Turns out he's a bit peeved you got the spare Growlithe and not him. If you talk to this officer though, he will ask you to breed an egg from your Growlithe, which by the way is always female to facilitate this, and bring him that egg. Not a hatched Growlithe. Save yourself a lot of time. Now go ahead and do just that. Bring him the egg, and he will trade you an egg in return. An egg that can be any of these 18 Pokémon. When you trade, you'll immediately get to see the pattern on the egg, which may tell you ahead of time which it is. Thing is, I'm really bad at telling what species will come out of the egg with this feature, so I'll probably have to wait until- oh. So yeah, Togepi. Probably the most well-known pattern possible. This is an interesting development. It may have one of the hardest evolution paths, being first a friendship evolution, then a shiny stone. This means you have to get all the level up moves that you want before using the shiny stone, but this will lead into a Togekiss, something that I am very used to seeing. Getting this Togepi ready could result in a ridiculously powerful team member, though it comes down to its stats. So let's hatch the Togepi and... Wow, it appears really good, though it does suck that it has such low special defense, being that it's Togekiss's best stat. However, this could be a linchpin Pokémon on my team. Of course, for now, its natural learn set, our lack of TMs, and no shiny stone makes it pretty unfulfilling to try using it now. We'll see what becomes of it. So now that that's done, we could advance the story, but first, let's go foreshadow the story. G. Gardevoir reports on the bomb blast that went off at the end of the previous episode which doesn't tell us very much about it except for the fact that the exit of Reborn City, the Grand Gates, are abandoned. How do you abandon an exit? On the next channel, the same Pokemon is doing an interview on-
Oh boy. Let's not worry about that for now. Save your brain cells. Who is Arclight going to spoil for us today? It's Shelly, who you'll recall from when we obtained the Wielder of Fury. He talks about how she's a shy bookworm, and that she... will utterly decimate you. She apparently is going to use rain, meaning fire types are going to have a bad time. Her technical aces are Illumis and Volbeat, though her fight doesn't exemplify either of them, as they mostly function in support roles. We're going to see how we do against Shelly, as always, at the end of the episode. I'm not looking forward to it. One last channel to watch, which is the hunting channel, to see what kind of event Pokemon we may find this time. Apparently, it will take place at a house in Lapis Ward with... Ugh, this is going to be quite an episode. We can now progress to the north of the Grand Hall, where the last officer blockade was when we started the game. Going up this way, you'll fight a few trainers as you make your way towards North Obsidia Ward. You'll approach an open plaza and find a crowd of people in front of the aforementioned Grand Stairs, including... Oh great, he's early. Talking to the cops shows that you can't investigate the explosion target more closely. As for Fern, he complains as per usual that he could do everything better than everyone, then says he's going to head to the Lapis Gym for his next badge. To which I say, fuck you, Fern. So besides that thankfully short encounter, what else is there to do in the north of Obsidia? If you go to the east and walk all the way down the streets till you reach a chasm, you'll see a restaurant called The Spice. Enter and talk to this guy, who is going to give me... What, you thought Reborn would give you leftovers by badge 3? As well, you can dig in this trash can to get the Fling TM. On your way over here, you'll see this building, which if you show up between 8pm and 4am real time, you'll get to enter. Well, enter the lobby. You see, this nightclub is very strictly invite only. How do you get invited? Be the champion. Or become a league member. Yeah, let me get right on that. But what you can get here is this, the Protect TM. That on its own is so valuable to so many compositions. Leave the nightclub, then walk to the right to go back to the left, ignoring that alleyway for now. Instead, go over to these two buildings on the left side of the plaza. The first one contains the move deleter, just for your reference. The second one is something for all returning players to chuckle at. Now, before we head up the stairs on the left in front of the waterfall, which this NPC describes a bit more, let's go back to that alleyway and see who's skulking around. You'll find two guys blocking the path beyond, who will tell you to buzz off. However, if you keep pestering them... So, you want to join the Magma Gang. That requires you to face this duo in a doubles battle, which for the first time besides gym leader battles, pits you against a full team of six. This may seem like it must be a difficult fight, but in truth, it really isn't. Most of the Pokemon you're about to face are not evolved. It starts with Numel, hey Numel, and Vulpix. Out first on my side are Frog and Cricketune. One good right now, and one not. Of course, Frogadier is fast as hell, so he can quad down the Numel with Water Pulse, while Cricketune can go for a sing on the Vulpix and fail. He gets a Flame Burst in the face for half his HP. Out to replace Numel is Fennekin. I go for it with Frog while attempting to sing again on the Vulpix. Another single Water Pulse removes its Gen 6 Contemporary and levels up the Cricketune, where it learns X Scissor. You can see me sitting on this menu for a long time, agonizing on the question. Is it time to retire Fury Cutter? But the Fury. Not yet, I can't do it. False Swipe isn't important, and we can TM it back on him. The Fury lives one more day, but not Cricketune. He gets outsped and blasted down, even though he won the apparent speed tie on the previous turn, with less speed than he has now. But then again, this is still Gen 7, when that speed change isn't calculated until the next turn. Regardless, it's time to bring out something else, which you'd think would be Camerupt. But he's nearing the level cap, and even though I have Hard Cap on, I don't want to flagrantly abuse it. Instead, I pick Meowstic, who should be fine against fire types. Son of a bitch. Frogadier goes after that Houndor while Meowstic fakes out the Vulpix to hopefully cancel out their entire side's turn. However, Houndor lives and eats a big chunk of Meowstic's HP. Fortunately, Meowstic has something to tink the Houndor down on the next turn while Frogadier takes out the Vulpix finally. 
This turns the fight into two on one, so the two Gen 6ers wreck the rest of Magma Gang's Pokemon, another Houndour, and a Slugma. Easy fight. For defeating the Magma Gang bouncers, we're let in. This lets us meet the rest of the gang besides Kriz and Nihil, who we just fought. That's Darm and Break. We also get the TM for Thief in here, on the nose. Finally, we meet the leader of Magma Gang, Maxwell. Hmm. He compliments our battle and tells us a bit about their gang's goal, which is to be Robin Hood, for themselves. He says that they have one major obstacle in achieving this goal. Aqua Gang. Hmm. He offers a spot in the gang and a cut of the take if we show up at a shack in Lapis for a job. We'll meet up with them later. Speaking of Lapis Ward, there's nothing left to do outside of it. Here's that thing I do with the music. The final ward of Reborn City, Lapis Ward, once again evokes a sense of stability in a place that is struggling inwardly. However, on top of this feeling is the ward's appeal to gentry. You'll see in much of the dialogue here that the people of this ward see the plights of the rest of the city as beneath them, really pushing the first world problems trope. One example of this is the bike shop, which if you recall from Pokemon Red for instance, a bike would sell for 1 million Poke Dollars. I've always been of the mind, being from the US, that a Poke Dollar would be 1 US Penny. Therefore, a bike in the Kanto region would cost $10,000, but it gets even worse in Reborn. Now this guy wants 100 million Poke Dollars, meaning my brain translates that to a million dollar bike. What is this, a Mr. Beast video? Leave the scam shop and head up to the next house. Surely this one can't be so bad. Oh, it can be, and worse. Then take that and multiply it by 100 and you get Crawdberry. The lady we saw in the news is the epitome of stuck-up rich person, who, if it weren't for the fact that she's a minor character, could be worse than Fern. Later in this episode, you'll see more of the crone. Leaving that behind for now, not nearly long enough. Let's proceed north to... Hmm, what building is this? Darkness is starting to make itself at home. Anyway, let's walk into the Pokemon Center next door and get told a tale about the Savage, a man who challenged one of the reborn gym leaders, the ghost-type leader Shade. We heard from him on the news already, barely. This challenger could not defeat Shade no matter how hard he tried, and his sanity slowly deteriorated, becoming more like Shade as his losses mounted. That sounds just cheerful. Leave the center and head east to this alleyway. You'll discover here the Aqua Gang, who already know you're in Magma Gang and keep you out. To all you wondering, yes, you could have come here first and joined Aqua Gang instead. Have I ever done this? Hell no. Magma Gang for life. Head up the street and beat some trainers along the way before entering the mart here. The people in here have interesting things to say. The first one talks about the improvement to the move Mist for the misty terrain like I described before. This guy talks about some changes to Picanium and Evium Z, as well as the Light Ball. And this guy... Oh, he gives you the Hail TM. That's all he meant. <laughs> Let's go next door. In this house, we will find that child who had two brushes with death in the same day, and the mother is extremely thankful to us. She will reward us with a new department store sticker. Let's go see what we've unlocked. Department store floor 4 has a strange assortment of items. The left counter has a bunch of items that fit some useful Pokemon strategies, such as White Herb, Power Herb, and Air Balloon, along with some other more niche items. The right counter has three other niche items, the Smoke Ball, the Destiny Knot, which I only just recently learned had a secondary effect on breeding, and the TM for round. But those pale in comparison to what else is for sale. Feast your eyes on the power items, the ultimate EV training items. This girl explains that these power items are four times more potent in Reborn than other regions, and they prevent the Pokemon wearing it from gaining EVs other than the one corresponding to the item it's holding. Let me break that down by numbers. 
Four times vanilla games means you get 32 EVs per battle wearing one of these. 252 is the maximum for any given EV, and you can max two stats with an extra six EVs left over. That means it will take a maximum of 17 knockouts to fully EV train any Pokemon, regardless of what those 17 opponents were. By the way, in case you don't know what EVs or effort values are for, a Pokemon that has the maximum of 252 EVs in a stat has more stat points than a Pokemon that has no EVs in that stat. The simplest way to understand is that two Pokemon of the same species at level 100 will have a difference of 63 stat points if one is fully EV trained in a stat and the other is not. These power items are the reason the EVs didn't really matter before because there was no sense in training EVs normally. Now, the only drawback to this is the fact that these items are mammothly expensive to us right now. However, it won't be long before I come sweep up one of each of these. Okay, let's go back to Lapis. Ignore that shack there for now, it's where Magma Gang is waiting. Talk to this girl to learn a bit about the effect of strong winds in battle, particularly that flying types lose their weaknesses. That's a wild card of an effect, though it's not the easiest thing to produce on the fly. We'll see it, but not too often. That's the caveat of Mountain and Thunder I mentioned earlier. The winds will prevent flying types from being weak to it. Head into this shop nearby called Sweet Scent, a flower shop. They have an assortment of interesting items to buy, like these floral charms I'll want now for some reason I won't tell you. You could also buy the Oricorio Nectars here, though you wouldn't have the actual Pokemon to use it, so leave them for later. Two other things to get in this shop are this Whalemer Pail for future berry tree growing, and this Spritzy by way of another tile puzzle. This puzzle functions the same as the first one, and you can cheat a little bit by looking at the pieces and finding a white line on the edge. Rotate the piece so that the white line is on the top for every piece. That will help you orient all of the negative space pieces. With that, head up the street, skip the top left building because there's nobody there, and enter the next open door on the right. In there, a move tutor can teach your starters the pledge moves, and tells you how their special effects work in single battles too. The last part of the city is in the northeast, which is where the gym is, but... Let's just put that off a little longer. Instead, return to the Magma Gang waiting at the shack. Once you arrive, the operation will commence, which involves breaking into the house of someone in Lapis and stealing their valuable Pokemon. The rub is that Aqua Gang is trying to do this too, and we have to beat them to it. The target? Crodberry. Oh boy. Head straight over there and find Darm already holding Crodberry as the rest stormed into the back. You might think to feel bad for Miss Crodberry, don't. Go into the next room and find that Aqua Gang has indeed plotted to steal the same Pokemon. You'll have to battle two trainers to get the prize, which involves some sizable leveled Pokemon, but they aren't anything too strong. If you want, use some healing items between battles and make sure you have something good against water types. Aqua Gang, water types, get out of here. Run to the table after beating the second trainer and grab the two items. First, a Firestone. Ooh, Growlithe is eyeing that. And second is the Pokemon. Weasel. With this, the operation is a success, which gets a scoff of disappointment from Aqua Gang's leader, Archer. Hmm. Head back to the alleyway in Obsidia to talk with the gang again, and Maxwell will let you keep the Weasel and tells you to lay low until the next job. So here I am, laying low, just casually returning to Crodberry's house. Upon doing so, the old woman will, completely correctly, Finger us as the culprit. However, the officer will not accept her accusation because he was this officer stuck in the cage in the underroot. He completely waves her off, which then incites this. Hey, I'm right there with you, buddy. Leave the raving woman's house and start walking away, at which point the officer comes out and apologizes. He thanks us again for saving him in Rotocreen, and he gives us a bike voucher. He also tells us... Oh. Uh... One bike, please.
Yay! No horrible nightmares and survivor's guilt for me. Not especially with this strangely menacing bike music. Now, I don't actually use the bike that much because I want my registered item to be the item finder almost always. But if you were someone who did, then you may tire of this music, which by the way is Relic Castle from Black and White, remixed by Glitch X City. If you are one of these people, stroll into the options menu and find this option to turn off the bike and surf music. Now riding the bike or surfing will not stop the current track. Once again, a new quality of life feature added late into Reborn's development. Okay, now that Magma Gang is quiet for now, we can do one more thing before heading to Shelly's gym. Go back to that shack that Magma Gang was in earlier and talk to this guy, who makes quite a few really good points about level cap woes while also... warning us about Shelly's merciless underlying power. Then he gives us the frustration TM. Good foreshadowing. Okay, I guess we can't run from it anymore. We have to find out what kind of repercussions Corey's grisly fate had. Go north to the gym and find Shelly, standing here with a red-haired guy who, if you were paying very close attention, you could see in the first episode. Shelly here, who we've only seen in a side quest so far, is very understandably upset about the man who just landed beside her gym while the spiky-haired dude insists that she stop looking at the bloody sight. The guy mutters about the mental state of the dead man. Trust me, it was not good. But we are spied on by two familiar faces, Aster and Eclipse. The dude who Shelly just introduced as Cal begins shouting profanely at the meteor duo, though a comment from Aster suddenly makes Cal shut up. Shelly tries to learn if the two up top did this, but after Aster almost spills something, Eclipse mildly threatens the 10-year-old, which gets Cal raging again. Eclipse belittles him and proceeds to leave, as Aster blabs something about the Grand Stairs. After loose-lipping that meteor blew them up, Eclipse uses sarcasm to shut up Aster, who proceeds to actually tell us that something might be hidden under- Oh, it's that guy again. Should I be jumping off a train? Anyway, Eclipse rails on Aster as the two leave, getting Cal to gloat over his doing nothing. Hey, do we want to talk about that guy? And now we put a name to the face, uh, Void. Shade. The figure gives no answer for his visit, or Cal's blunt inquiry. Instead, somehow, he causes Cory's horrible end to vanish from sight, along with himself. Cal calls us a chump like he does everyone else, and as Shelly tries to apologize for him, and many other things, you poor girl, Cal keeps pushing her to go back into the gym. Once they leave, Kane arrives to catch up since our meeting in the jungle against the last Tangrowth Pulse. In this timeline, if you recall, we did not rescue Kane because we were not thrown in a cage. Instead, Heather rescued Kane to ask him to help fight Meteor. Now, since that fight, Kane has been looking for Heather again. But in the meantime, he mentions the explosion in Obsidia. He was looking for Heather to show up there, but instead saw two people run out of the staircase, no doubt the meteors we just saw. When he inquires, we try in vain to tell him about Cory, but he just talks over us or just talks. Who knows what we actually say in-game. Again, Boolean. Anyway, Kane suggests we investigate the Grand Stairs more thoroughly. He will create a diversion so we can sneak inside to find out more. Heading right over there, Kane waits on the right side for your signal. When you give it, Kane distracts the officer the best way he can think of. Fortunately for us, it works, and we can run for the chasm in the stairs, into which a ladder is handily lowered. Here enters the first tonal shift of the game. The atmosphere of the cave is completely unlike the squalid city outside. There's an otherworldly charm to this cave, one that reminds you that this is a Pokemon game, one that is eager to show off its grandiose beauty. This is helped considerably by another of Glitch X City's remixes, Mount Coronet, though not the same version as the one I highlighted in Episode 2. This track always stuck with me, giving me this feeling like the game has suddenly expanded that things are getting real. Start making your way down and use the item finder frequently. 
there's a lot to pick up. However, going down one more ladder reveals you won't be able to fully explore this place yet. More rock smash stones are in your way if you try to go north at the first junction. Instead, go down another ladder and after surveying the area for items, reach this large ledge hill. What you'll find going down it is that there are four distinct paths, depending on how far to the left or right you jump down. If you go all the way to the left, you'll reach this ladder which heads back up to the previous level. You can get a ground gem and super repel this way, but other than that you're back to where you started. Next, try going down the rightmost side. On your way though, stop on this ledge and get... Oh, yes. The ultimate cheese item. Let me make it very clear, these are very rare. If you must use it, make sure it lets you beat something you had literally no other way to beat. Going down the rest of the way will show you that there's a lot of other paths in this place. Many you can't even reach even with Rock Smash. There will be many mysteries to uncover here. Once you reach the bottom and head down another ladder, you'll see a cave entrance nearby. After you pick up this star piece, head in there. When you enter, this message appears. This will be a good time to explain the new field effect of this location, Crystal Cavern. You'll notice that this field connects to Cave. I didn't mention this last episode, but Cave is able to transform to Crystal Cavern by using Diamond Storm and Power Gem. So actually just Power Gem for like 95% of the game. The first thing we need to discuss for this field is the concept of Crystal Types. This is a mechanic revolving around the four cardinal colors I mentioned before and the gems they represent, namely Ruby, Sapphire, Emerald, and Amethyst. What this means on the crystal field is that certain effects gain an additional typing based on which gem is active in the sequence. That sequence goes fire, water, grass, and psychic. It always starts on fire, goes in that order, and repeats in that sequence once you pass psychic. Each time an effect uses the crystal typing, it moves to the next one. So what effects use the crystal typing? All rock moves. They also gain a 50% power boost. These four moves also gain the crystal type and a 50% power jump. Prismatic Laser gains a crystal type as a secondary type. Stealth Rock will use the crystal type instead of rock to determine effectiveness. Camo will change the user to the crystal type. That's all there is for crystal types, but there are other changes as well. Dragon type moves gain a 50% power increase. Prism Armor reduces damage by all moves by 25%, not just super effective moves. Man, this field really likes Necrozma for some reason. These moves will be 50% more powerful while these moves will be 30% more. Why are there all these legendary moves? Rock Polish will also raise both attacks by one stage. Aurora Veil can be used without Hail Up. Nature Power becomes Power Gem. Secret Power may cause Burn, Freeze, Sleep, or Confusion. Using a Magical Seed raises Special Attack by one stage and applies Magic Coat. You can make this field into a cave again if you use one of these moves. So once again, we have one of those fields that can more or less switch with another field at will. This greatly increases the depth of the strategy on the field, since a user that relies heavily on one field may be hampered by the other. As for its own merits, Crystal Cavern affects quite a few random moves as well as two entire types, one of which gets an additional layer of strategy in the Crystal types which forces you to remember not only what type the crystal is, but also calculating a double type chart against your opponent. That being said, even though there is depth to the strategies, you won't have to overcome very many insane fights here. This is more of a traveling hindrance, though it does have a lot of potential. Depth, six. Difficulty, three. So the reason I mentioned Crystal Cavern in this room is because of that text box. It's suggesting we break the Crystal Cavern using those moves it set. One of those is Magnitude. Oh, easy. I'll just go over to Camera Up and... Shit. My brain really did think he still knew it. Uh-oh. How do we get to the Field Effect item ball that I just read for you? Well, if you battle in this cave, the Pokemon you'll encounter are perfectly suited to use Magnitude on you and it will break the crystals just the same. Obtain the field effect readout for Crystal Cavern and then go north from outside the cave. Let me just go up that ladder after this... unknown. What word did I use earlier? Otherworldly? Hmm. Continue up the ladder, and speaking of otherworldly, there's a Lunatone. Of course, it's stuck behind the rocks you can't break yet, so write that down. Grab three items before climbing the next ladder. A Magical Seed, 
candy, and heart scale. In the next section, grab the secret candy with the non-secret ability capsule. Jumping down the ledge just north will bring you back to the beginning of the dungeon. Head back to the south to jump down the big hill again. Before we get to the correct path, let's go down what I call the default path. It's just to the right of the leftmost path. Just because it's called the default path doesn't mean it has nothing noteworthy. Go to the left and head up the western stairs first. Then cut to the left in this sneaky nook to find the TM for rock polish. At the top of the western stairs, you'll find a black belt, which portends all manner of special challenges. He gives you candy. Yeah, take that stranger's candy. With that, ascend the right side staircase, eating up the dusty floor items as you go, and jump off the ledge to return to the top of the ledge hill to descend for the last time. Go down the correct route by doing this, and don't jump off to the left back to the default route yet. Climb down the ladder. Why so ominous? Oh shit. Okay, I was holding my breath. The intense man tells you that you may rescue Victoria without him interfering. Thanks, I guess. After that harrowing encounter ends, head to the left and find Victoria in a cell behind Aster and Eclipse. Aster is incredulous that their boss just let you pass him, which gets a cynical response from Eclipse, who seems not to fully buy Meteor's bullshit. This leaves you to face the two privates again. At first glance, you may think this is going to be a one-on-two, but Victoria surprises both you and the duo by pulling out her Pokémon and battling from within the cell. Leading this fight for the Meteors are their second Pokémon pair, Solrock and Lunatone, while both Victoria and I start with our starters. Fun fact, when I started this game the very first time, Victoria would have had a Pig Knight at this point, which would have been hella disadvantaged here but now a Tora Cat makes for interesting trades. The battle begins. I throw a Water Pulse at the Soul Rock while Tora Cat bites the Lunatone. It would have resulted in a knockout if we consolidated, but Lunatone flinches while Frog is hit with a Psy Wave for decent damage. Next turn, I go for the healthier Celestial while Tora Cat indeed goes for the weaker one. The two of us unscathed on the turn. This leads the admins to unleash their other remaining Pokemon, which I'm sure you could guess from our first encounter with them. Indeed, their rock ruffs are now both lichen rocks, which is a scary proposition. I've always found it interesting how they use two different ones, Eclipse a midday and Aster a midnight, another split in their personalities. Once again, being unable to talk with the NPC within this video game results in us attacking different opponents, leaving both alive where one could have fallen. Worse, after taking a bite first, Frog takes a Thunderfang from the now confused Midnight Lycanroc, who of course doesn't lose its turn. Frogadier goes down, and I resist sending in camera up since he's already at the level cap. I switch to Meowstic instead. I decide to forego Fake Out since it would be resisted, and try to kill Midday, but am unable to do so with only a Psy Shock. Toracat this time hits the same target and mops up Eclipse. However, a second bite from Aster's side takes out my Meowstic too. At this point, I just let Camera up come in to finish off the second Lycanroc, though it uses a double-boosted Rock Tomb to take out the Toracat as a parting gift. Earth Power sends it away. With the Privates defeated, Eclipse now whines about why Victoria got to keep her Pokémon 
who reveals it was Corey himself who told her to prepare for just the right moment. In the end, he still hated Meteor. Eclipse stops caring, as she guesses their boss feels the same, and leaves with another idle threat. Victoria claims how Corey and the leader we just spoke with both treated her without cruelty, the sinister man telling her much the same as he told us. She admits that his story makes Ame and the city appear to be in the wrong, but also won't back down against Meteor and their methods. At this point, she is ready to leave and offers to go with us to the surface. Fast travel! Once you surface above ground, either with Victoria or by yourself, you'll see her standing south of you. Talk to her, and similar to episode 2, after her explanation that she can't keep falling behind in training, she asks you for a battle again. Like before, this is optional, only this time you'll go down in relationship points if you refuse, rather than missing out on an increase. We accept her challenge. Like the last time we faced her, she still has a Pancham, which she starts with to our Meow Stick. One easy tight matchup later, we find out Victoria and her Pichu have forged a great friendship while in captivity. So now it's a Pikachu, with the anime voice. Pikachu! Unfortunately for this Pikachu, it's getting Earth powered. Next out is her starter, as we saw from the fight earlier, Toracat, being higher level than most of our team. Frogadier is going to take that. It does outspeed to bite him, but fortunately we dodge the flinch and wipe it out with a crit water pulse. She caps the fight with Curlia, which is perfectly covered by Meowstic again. With a fake out and shadow ball, Curlia is beaten and we win against Victoria. So you might be wondering why I turned on the reset counter. Because of this. Just read this dialogue and hate Fern with me. After gloating how he got a young girl to cry, he challenges you thinking he's unstoppable. Victoria heals us and gives me all the advice I need. However, you may be noticing something right about now. Yeah, we're doing that thing again, where we have to fight two consecutive battles in a row, commonly referred to as a gauntlet, and unlike the opening of the game, these aren't just throwaways. I can't change who led, which was Meowstic. Against his opener Rhyhorn, I would probably be fine to use Meowstic, but a Rhyhorn has decent defense which diminishes Psyshock, while Shadow Ball is not same type. In the end, I choose to change to Frogadier for the easy kill. However, this awards us a four-turn Rock Blast with one crit in the mix, leaving Frog in bad shape. Worse, Fern switches off to his Dartrix again, who takes our Water Pulse without getting confused. Over to Camerup now, who tanks the Ominous Wind for a little damage. Dartrix follows with a Pluck, but is torched by Lava Plume. Now he's finally evolved that Sand Isle into Crocorock, which leaves me with a choice of Frog or Cricketune. Frog may not kill with one attack and will go down easy, especially if the Croc has a priority move. I settle on Cricketune, which rewards me with an incredible outcome. I should have gone for the X Scissor and gotten the kill, but I wasn't sure it would have been enough. Instead, I go for Fury Cutter and get a Quick Claw Trigger. I almost kill with Fury Cutter, but get answered with a Fire Fang, which will drop me on the next one. In order to finish him, I go for X Scissor to avoid the 5% mischance, and a second Quick Claw lets me destroy the Crocorock. That second Quick Claw was critical. As it all stands to reason that between us at level 31, the croc was faster, but Cricketune instead pulls out a 1 in 25 chance to chop the croc. But now Fern switches to my most hated member of his team, besides himself, Roserade. I hate fighting this thing. I send Growlithe out to it, but her extra sensory is way stronger than even my super effective Fire Fang. The Roserade brushes off my Growlithe. I send Camerupt out to burn it up, but unfortunately his neutrality to grass is his undoing as Roserade's Giga Drain gets back a quarter of her own HP, causing her to survive the Lava Plume. Being faster, the Roserade runs down my camera up too. With so little health left, I try just having Meowstic finish it off with Fake Out, but still, it survives, poison pointing me in the process. I feel like I'm about to get crushed again, but no, Meowstic just straight up outspeeds it and kills with Psyshock. That was important, and now all that's left is what Fern tried to avoid at the beginning. Frogadier slaps down the slow and quad-weak Rhyhorn to give me the first try against the shit jockey. Guess I didn't need the reset counter after all. No, idiots, you're the noob for not getting a full team yet! Victoria gets a charge out of us winning over him, while he continues to act as arrogant as ever. You don't get to use that. You're not nearly as worthy. And also, fuck you, Fern. As he leaves, Victoria shouts after him, 
all of which I'm for, but there is something else to this. Victoria quickly stops and scolds herself for getting so angry. I can't blame her myself, I mean, did you read what that guy said? However, this shows that Victoria seems to have a weakness in her own anger. But regardless, for tolerating Fern and winning this gauntlet, Victoria gives us TMX7 Rock Smash. Oh yes, but we can't use it until we get the badge from Shelly. Oh yeah, she kind of had to deal with Fern, huh? We'll go back to Shelly's gym, but one thing first. Head back over to the nightclub while it's open, again between 8 p.m. and 4 a.m. Out front, you'll get to meet the investigation squad himself, DJ Arclight. He tells us the same thing as his bouncer, that in order to access the nightclub he runs, we'll have to take on the league and become champion, something he himself doesn't think is necessary, but the league apparently overrides him on this. If we want to get in there, we'll have no choice but to conquer the league. That's the last we'll see of Arclight for a while. Except for the TV shows, of course. Head now to Shelly's gym, and we'll see if we can help out. However, upon reaching the gym, Cal bursts through the door and makes it perfectly clear we are not welcome. Then he battles us, which feels kind of counterproductive, as this should mean we have to stay here instead of leaving, but whatever, there's going to be a lot to unpack right now. Immediately, the first thing you should notice is that from out of nowhere, just like this fight with Cal, there is an entirely different track playing. Let me say I'm pretty bad, like really bad, at placing the original song of a remix, but it's hard not to recognize Marnie's battle from Sword and Shield. This remix done by, of course, Glitch X City. Then the very next thing you should notice, because the game is going to force this to happen every time in this fight, is this. During this fight, it will be raining, guaranteed. Cal's first Pokemon is Torkoal, which activates Drought to change it to Sun. Rain plus Sun creates a rainbow, and now we get to talk about the most transient field in the game, Rainbow Field. Rainbow Field is a very strange field that barely appears in the game as the starting field. However, it proves to be a very useful replacement field. Something that can lay over the top of another field to provide respite from whatever things that yet unnamed horrible field effects are going to do to you. You can utilize Rainbow Field in such a manner through one of two methods. Either use Fire Pledge and Water Pledge in the same battle, as long as the field doesn't change between the use of either move, or use the more reliable method that you just witnessed. Doing so will cause Rainbow to appear for either 4 or 7 turns when using the pledges, or the duration of the last weather used, which, with a weather extending rock, could mean 8 turns away from whatever field was underneath. As a side note, you get this field effect readout before you even face Julia, back at the Grand Hall from this guy. So what happens on the chromatic field? Special normal type moves, which includes things like Hyper Beam and Boom Burst, gain 50% power and roll a random secondary type. More potently, the chance of a move's secondary effect activating is doubled. That could be real trouble. Pokemon that are asleep get the effect of leftovers while sleeping. Wonder Skin will make all status moves have 0% accuracy. Marvel Scale activates. Prism Armor reduces damage from all moves by 25%. Soul Heart, this means you, Magirna, raises special defense by one stage when activated. Cloud 9 raises one of the bearer's stats by one at the end of each turn. Bad Dreams is disabled. Sorry, Darkrai, you can ruin my life later. As well, this fuck ton of moves gets a 50% power bump, and Solar Beam and Solar Blade will not need a charge turn. That's a lot of different attacks you now need to think about, the most dangerous being Moonblast, Dragon Pulse, and Tri-Attack, the last of which you recall also gets an additional 50% boost, making it a 180 power move that could potentially hit any weakness, holy shit! Meanwhile, these moves lose 50% of their power. Cosmic Power will raise both defenses by two stages. Meditate raises attack by three stages. Wow, getting triple value. Sonic Boom deals. Are you ready for this? 140 damage. Not sure why a move named after a sound phenomenon gets multiplied by seven. You know, rainbow, seven colors. Anyway, Nightmare won't work. Wish heals 75% max HP. Aurora Veil can be used without hail. Nature Power becomes Aurora Beam. Camouflage is Dragon type, a pretty uncommon shift. Secret power can inflict paralysis, poison, burn, freeze, or sleep, basically physical tri-attack. 
Magical Seed will raise special attack by one stage and give a wish to the user. If you decide you don't want happy colorful rainbows, then you can use Hail or Sandstorm to remove it. That or Light that burns the sky or Splintered Storm Shards. This is an interesting field, because like the fields that are generated by moves of their same name, you can get this effect to happen almost anywhere. This can allow you to form a party that makes good use of it and it can overwrite almost any field that's present, thus shutting down your opponent's strengths. That being said though, there isn't a lot of cohesiveness to this field. If you're using Tri-Attack and Sonic Boom, sure, they are greatly powered up and most trainers are unlikely to have those moves to use against you. But besides the possibility of using Aurora Veil Meditate to set up something fast to sweep opponents, this field is mostly to prevent our opponent from using their full power, rather than maximizing our own. In the end, most of the benefits you'll enjoy from Rainbow will be happy little accidents. Depth 4 Difficulty 4 Let's talk about one more thing before we actually battle Cal. This fight, this theme, even this appearance of Cal? None of it existed until the final release of Reborn. There are a lot of early game inclusions of characters that originally appeared later on, and Cal being here always struck me as odd because of what I knew about him already. If you were one of the people who had played episode 18 or earlier and didn't replay the game, then I can guess you're pretty confused by the way he's acting. We'll go more into Cal in later episodes, of course. It's time to actually battle him now. This fight pushes you pretty hard, and dealing with a new terrain you're likely never to have seen before is going to complicate matters. It doesn't help that his lead is so bulky. I start out with Meowstic faking him out, then slowly chopping him down with Psy Shocks after putting up a light screen. Torkoal hits back with a fire spin and sets up Stealth Rocks, which are going to hurt me since I'm so switch happy. However, even though she gets beat up, Meowstic puts out the Torkoal, which now ushers in Houndoom. That's a huge issue. I go out to Frogadier to try to quell the Hellhound, but in Sun, Water Pulse does bad damage, and Beat Up did a ton to me. I quick attack to bring him down below half, but Frog is down and Camera Up will have to send Houndoom back to heck. One Earth Power after dodging an Inferno does the trick, and the Sun fades. I admit I played badly sending out Frog so soon since Camera Up would have been fine to take him out, then saved Frog for when the sunlight faded, especially as it becomes apparent that all Cal has are fire types. Next is another brutal opponent, Mag Mortar. I don't want Camera Up to get chewed up early, so I try sending out Zeb. After getting decked to 10 health with Fire Punch after Stealth Rock damage, Zeb paralyzes it. I expect this to be all Zeb Strike I can do, but then, Paralysis kicks in on Mag Mortar. Not once, not twice, but three times. I'm first astounded by the 1 in 64 that Zeb just casually got, but also that the Mag Mortar was apparently still faster even after the speed reduction. I found out on the fourth turn, after Zeb landed three sparks, that it was because he was going for Mach Punch. That must have been infuriating for Cal, but Zeb Strika finally hits the bench after a great showing. Camera Up comes back to clean up, though he once again gets chip damage by rocks and Mach Punch. I should really have left Camera Up out so that Stealth Rock would stop getting free damage, but I go back to Meowstic to soften Charmeleon. I go first after Fake Out to bring it down by two thirds as Dragon Rage knocks out Meowstic. I send out Growlithe to do a close combat after also getting Dragon Raged and Cal's final Pokemon is Quilava. Camera Up comes out to get chipped once more and take a tri-attack on the chin, but survives all of it to Earth Power the Quilava once and win the match. A lot went wrong in that fight, but even so, Cal can't push me back. Upon defeating Cal, Victoria immediately runs up demanding to know what's wrong. Cal reasserts that the gym is closed after Shelly watched Cory end his life and Fern existed near her. However, Victoria assures Cal that we are here to help Shelly, mentioning that we whooped Fern. Yes, we did. At this, Cal relents and lets us into the gym. He's just inside as we enter, and tells us someone else is here too. Someone not nearly as bad as Fern. Well, that could be anyone in the world. Well, except... Never mind. What he meant was Kane who even by his own admission got here by pure luck after that diversion. Shelly sits on the couch traumatized by the events in Reborn, hey me too, as Kane and Victoria try to be reassuring, both agreeing that Fern is an asshole. Cal comes in to get us to give Shelly some room, which she'll need as Victoria asks Kane why he's here. You shouldn't have brought that up, Kane. Afterwards, Kane feels immensely guilty and leaves, while Cal is also dumbstruck. He figures that Shelly getting sick from stress is worth a visit from a doctor. However, the one he mentions is... 
No. That's the last thing she needs, or anyone else. God damn it, do I have to? Sorry, it's the rules. Head over to the orphanage, looming dauntingly in the center of Lapis Sword, and oh. Excuse me, Miss Ooh. She seemed happy to be leaving. Oh boy. Enter the door she left unlocked now to. Was that a flashback? A flash forward? Both? Or neither? The young girl apparently thought that we were that pink-haired woman that just left, evidently named Laura. Nope, can't say I am. Though we are glowy, allegedly. The boy nearby tells the girl that we aren't glowy, uh, and the girl relents even though she remains convinced of our glowiness. This is... Anna. She has a Jirachi named Nostra. A what? She then introduces us to her twin brother who corrected her, named Noel who clarifies that neither Nostra nor his doll Nomos are real Pokemon. Anna insists that they aren't dolls, that they are, along with her pendant, important guardians from their parents. Anyway, the other person she introduces is Charlotte, the other character in this room who isn't a duplicate of themselves. Anna gives us a description of her that Charlotte refuses on account of it not being true at all. In any case, Charlotte greets us and lets us know that Laura, who just left, was her sister. Oh, that's nice. And one of the Elite Four. Yeah, I'll just take that like Charlotte does. No big deal. That's when Noel begins saying that's when Anna tells us that on top of Laura being an Elite Four, Noel and Charlotte are gym leaders too. What the fuck is up with this orphanage? Well, let's get right into that, shall we? Charlotte explains that Laura turning 18 is the reason she was freed from this place, as Charlotte says relieved, though dismal towards her own continuing stay. This is when we learn why they don't like the doctor. Okay, back to that sociopathy I'm used to. At this point, their attention finally comes to why we even showed up in such a wonderful place, and it was to get help from this... doctor. Anna is quick to warn us that this is a bad idea. Anna, you and I both know I've played this game before. I know. I didn't want to. But then interestingly, she says her doll is warning her that the doctor is coming. It turns out he really is. The doctor is in. Dr. Sigmund Connell. Yes, this is the man who took the child from the slums. I told you that the child knew not what they said. At this point, he inquires to our visit, which Anna jumps in to say it was to challenge gym leaders and nothing else. The doctor tells us how the kids here are gym leaders, who either earned or inherited their positions. Sigmund then decides he will test our skill against one of his orderlies. But wait, I didn't... Uh This won't end well. Orderly John starts with a slowpoke against my Cricketune. So maybe I can bluff my way through this? I hit it with X Scissor while taking a crit headbutt back. Wow, thanks. Luck isn't on my side either. The slowpoke faints to a second scissor, but up next is Magneton. Fortunately, both Growlithe and Camerupt are still alive, though not well. I send the latter out to both hit it with a quad weakness and be immune to its electric moves. Of course, a Magneton is faster, and goes for Mirror Shot, which miraculously both doesn't kill and doesn't cause Camerupt to miss from the accuracy drop. Indeed, an Earth Power dismantles the Magneton. The final opponent in this comedy of errors is E-Electric, who has no weaknesses thanks to having Levitate as an electric type. In that case, I try sending out Cricketune since he's the healthiest. However, the first X Scissor doesn't take half off the eel, and discharges more than capable of fainting the crickets. I don't get a second chance to attack being slower, so I have to hope that Growlithe is faster. He is faster! Ugh. So that's a loss. What the fuck? So anyway, Sigmund compliments us on our skill, yeah, real skill, but then begins the bullshit. He says that the gym leaders are not in a position to battle now, but that the orphanage's built-in arena, hello, is undergoing repairs, and that the battles themselves will cause the patients present to be adversely affected. Even though that's some bullshit, Anna takes it so we can bail now. However, Sigmund is quick to the ruse, and gives her a thinly veiled threat, to which she stands down. In whatever arcane way we communicate, we tell him that Shelly needs an examination, which he says he will do at a later time. With this, we get the hint to leave. Yeah, don't mind if I do- Anna relays another message from Nostra, apparently. What she says is, prescient. Okay, let's just... Okay, 
You just don't worry about that. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to go heal my fucking Pokemon. After doing so, return to Lapis Gym to relay the message to Shelly. Incredibly, this message, from a girl that never met Shelly, nor did she actually know what was specifically wrong with Shelly, gives the bug gym leader her legs back. She wants to find Heather, though Victoria gently denies this for her own health. However, Shelly pushes back, saying that doing anything will help her take her mind off everything that's happened. She says she will use a signal to call Heather, then asks if we want to battle her for the third badge. Everyone accepts this plan, as Shelly goes to make the signal. Victoria and Cal marvel at Shelly's fortitude, as Victoria asks Cal how they met. Cal says he was part of the league before, and mentions that he felt bad for her, that she's always been overlooked, like himself. Then, Victoria asks us to be gentle in our fight with Shelly. By winning on our first try? Look, Victoria, Oil Drum, the character, will win on the first try. Oil Drum, the player, is going to pull his fucking hair out. But before said hair pulling, let's take care of two more things outside the gym. First, head back to Obsidia near the Magma Gang hideout and talk to this Magma Grunt. He spills that he was the one who bought the rare Pokemon from the kid in the slums, but then immediately got beaten by an Aqua Grunt who took it. He gives us a metronome to help us take down the opposing faction's Grunt. Metronome the held item, by the way, not the move. Metronome isn't even a TM in Gen 7. Head over to Lapis to find this Aqua Gang member and defend your gang's reputation. However, as you enter combat against this punk, you'll see that he apparently has Shelly's badge, because he's beyond our level cap. First up is a Toxapex, the tanky urchin, something we're going to see often. Meowstick is up front, so we trade a fake out and two Psyshocks for a poison jab to take it out. However, next comes one of those bastard Pokemon I don't have a hope to outspeed. Sharpedo. This thing is ruthless. I send Zebstrika out to it, only to whiff a Thunder Wave trying to hobble its speed, then get damage ranged on the second Ice Fang. Being part dark, Krikatoon is next best suited for it. Sharpedo frustratingly gets a crit on its first Ice Fang though, and my X Scissor isn't enough to kill, and of course it goes first to kill. Finally, after losing two to this thing, I send out Frog to quick attack it, thus learning Smackdown in the process, which overwrites Lick. His final entry, though, is a Lapras. You can't get much bulkier than that. I decide to have Meowstic go back out since my team, Sans Zeb, is badly suited to fight a Lapras. I start with a Fake Out and Light Screen, which cuts the Ice Beam damage I take pretty well. However, Extra Sensory is not going to kill it, so we go out to Camera Up afterwards. I'm here hoping that even though he's four times weak, a water move behind a light screen won't kill. Well, I'll never find out because of that fucking crit. Now things are sliding downhill. Only two left, I send Frog back out to use his newly learned Smackdown, which does basically nothing. Worse, the light screen wears off, so Ice Beam, or anything, is probably going to kill now. Even though it's so close to fainting, it takes out my now Rock-type Frog, and I have to go to Growlithe and hope it's faster. It's not. That one annoyed me. Lapras is such an unkillable fiend. The Sharpedo took out my best chance to kill it in Zeb Strika. So let's try again and play around the shark a bit more. The same thing with Toxapex happens again, as I now switch to Krikatoon to fight Sharpedo. Of course, this time, Luck decides that I can just push the Sharpedo aside after it misses the Ice Fang, and I damage range it instead, killing it in one round. So the fight should be a walk now, right? Wrong. Even though I send my Electric Zebra out for Lapras and land the Thunder Wave, a returning Ice Beam blasts him down. Now, Camera Up gets to come out and do some damage, but even a first Rock Slide that triggers a flinch only gets one-third of its HP, and after a second that gets neither flinch nor paralysis, I'm brined again. I don't want to use Meowstic since she's at level cap, so I try going back to Frogadier. However, since I didn't kill Sharpedo with it, it doesn't have Smackdown now. Instead, I go for Lick and Quick Attack, trying to see what was better damage. The answer is that the damage isn't good at all. Meanwhile, Lapras is losing its turns to Paralysis, so it seems like this should be fine anyway. I decide to smokescreen it for insurance, and get paid instantly. However, after my next quick attack, RNG decides it's done liking me, and lets the Ice Beam land and freeze. Then the luck really taunts me, as I stay frozen for three consecutive turns, as the Lapras is fully paralyzed and then misses. It then gets me on the third try. This Lapras has still taken down three of my Pokemon. Finally, I say screw it. We're nearly done with this level cap, so Meowstic comes out to fake it out to death. Of course, after the battle, the Grunt tells us something I'm sure you were expecting. He doesn't have the rare Pokemon. He says he sold it to someone on 7th Street. Okay, let's see. 5th Street, 
and this is fourth. All right, so let's... Okay, it's in another ward. It must be an Obsidia and... Eighth... Uh, what? Let me simplify this. You can't get there yet. We'll have to wait until later. One last thing to do, which is very cryptic and out of your way, is to go back to Barrel Ward, to the rooftop where we found that Helioptile. There we find... Is the survivor's guilt already that strong? Turns out that Cory has traveled somewhere in the city, which is here in Peridot Ward. Approaching him will make him flee again, to this previously empty room near the magma hideout. Enter and talk with Cory. Cruel trick. Catch a tricky fox Pokemon. That's all there is to do, at least in terms of events in this episode. As for me, I need to do some preparing. Vanilla is tagging back in, evolving into Vanillish at the very cusp of the level cap. I'll also be teaching him Hail, which was very fortunate to receive this episode. As you might have guessed with a bug gym coming up, Meowstic will be sitting this one out for obvious reasons, and Vanilla will be taking her place. Now that our team is prepared, we can go back to Shelly's gym and tackle one of the most infuriating combinations of gym puzzle and battle in the game. First, the puzzle. Once you beat all of the gym's extra trainers, you'll be able to access computer screens mounted around the room. Each of these screens displays several colors on it, and the bookshelves corresponding to those colors change one height level. In order to reach Shelly in the east side of the gym, you need to form a bridge to her by raising these bookshelves correctly. The gym trainers give vague hints about how to do the puzzle, with this one telling us the only concrete hint that this screen near Shelly's room is the last one to use. Let me show you what happens. If you hit this screen, then the bookshelves colored blue, orange, green, white, and purple will change by one level. This makes the blue one to our left raise one level and allow us to reach the upper section. On the other side, this screen changes the same shelves except for green. Now the stairs in the shelf are too high to reach, so we can't activate both screens to advance, only one. Back here in the upper section, you can see that some of the shelves have already risen, and that some of them block other screens. From here, you have to raise shelves the correct amount to reach screens in the correct order. It is one of my most hated puzzles, and I have never won- And I got through it in one try. I swear that I didn't cheat. I just autopiloted it to start out, and it just worked. I swear it's hard. If you get here and you find it is really hard, then use Cal's hint here to help yourself. I swear it's hard. Alright, anyway. Go south to the small room and pick up a leaf stone, and then prepare as Shelly awaits you in the north. When you're finally ready, talk to Shelly, who tells you something very interesting and unexpected. She says how she's so much of a bookworm as a way to measure up to her brother, who is a gym leader in the Johto region. So in order to impress him and be just as cool as him, she traveled to a region rippling with societal rot and a terrorist organization's rampant destruction. Don't worry, you are cool, Shelly. Okay, you're pushing it, Shelly. Take your place and begin the carnage. Team Comp Review Time Leading the pack in the upcoming first double gym battle is Frogadier and Cricketune. Frogadier has Smackdown to hit bugs nicely and can make use of rain while it's up to boost his water moves. Cricketune in a forest field means he can use Struggle Bug to hit both opponents, who may not be resistant to the boosted attack. Zeb Strika joins us as a semi-fast support who can paralyze and use Flame Charge if the rain isn't dampening that. Growlithe will be good if I can get rid of the rain, obviously hitting the bugs with their weakness. As for getting rid of the rain in the forest, we have my backline, Camerupt and Vanillish. As we saw from Cal's fight, if we try to use Sun before burning the forest, then the forest gets replaced by Rainbow, and Forest will come back as the rainbow disappears. So instead, we have Vanillish ready to make it hail, while Camerupt will take the chance to Lava Plume everything to cinders. As you were probably all expecting since two episodes ago, because I foreshadowed like an eight-year-old, Shelly's battle takes place on Forest Field. That is definitely the best field she could use to have an ungodly advantage over me. What's worse, she opens with Masquerain and Illumis, and the Illumis has Prankster, 
which is how she sets up Rain Dance on the first turn every time. Additionally, the Masquerain intimidates me, making anything but Water Pulse and Struggle Bug on my leads unoptimal. By the way, why is a Masquerain intimidating, other than being a two and a half foot long bug? So the fight starts, as I said, using Water Pulse on the Illumis so it can't redo the rain and struggle bugging their whole side. However, the Masquerain literally Dragon Ball Z's my Frogadier down in one hit, as Struggle Bug fails to kill the Illumis, though reducing its special attack. I get Zeb out here to zap the Flying Bug down, but Prankster, Confuse Ray, and Bad Luck have other plans. The Masquerain then cuts off Krikatoon with Struggle Bug and lowers its special attack. Krikatoon is still able to kill the Illumis, but I'm not happy about that missed turn. The next thing that comes out is Anorith. Without Frog, I have very little to hit it with super effective. And first turn it will take no damage thanks to that Telluric Seed Spiky Shield. Krikatoon does nearly nothing at this point, as a Rock Slide comes in to crush him and leaves Zeb with little HP. Which he makes even littler thanks to another Self Punch, losing his last chance to hit the damn Masquerade. Yeah, that one was maddening. And you'll notice that I realized my reset counter wasn't on. Wonder what was on my mind then? Being half in the grave, I know I have to get this forest burned down now. Camerupt and Vanillish are going to hit the field together. And since Camerupt is slower than Vanillish, we can do a 1-2 Hail Lava Plume Punch. Or the 1-2 Fuck Me Sideways, that's what I call that. The fight is completely over. Vanillish will not get a chance to use Hail again. And even if Camerupt fires off the Lava Plume, that our Aquanid she just yanked Masquerade for is going to annihilate him. I don't even get a chance to hit with Growlithe. Attempt 2 starts nearly the same, with Frogadier getting Energy Balled to the next dimension. However, Krikatoon gets a crit on Illumis to send it away. Shelly and I use the same replacements as last time, and once again my side gets to do literally nothing as another Rock Slide flinches Zeb while Krikatoon is broken under both of her Pokemon's attacks. I send out Vanillish to try to get Hail going as soon as possible. For the fourth fucking time, Zeb Strika fails to act, and he dies to the following Struggle Bug. Fortunately, you get to see a bit of the Clutch Master, as he tanks both hits and doesn't flinch this time, putting up the hail. Camera up stomps onto the field and prepares for Hellfire, while Vanillish will vainly try to act once more, even though the Rock Slide from the Anorith is going to shatter him. Turns out, no, the Masquerade goes first to deliver the final blow, while Rock Slide takes a big chunk out of Camera up. But finally, the Camel erupts and the field goes up, while also burning both of Shelly's Pokémon. We almost drop the two bugs at once, but though Hail knocks the Masquerade out of the sky, the Anorith survives field effect damage, Hail, and burn damage. I pull out Growlithe to hopefully capitalize on the field now, but that Water Spider is back. Camerup goes for his own Rock Slide to maybe do more damage to the Araquanid, while Growlithe would Fire Fang down the Anorith. However, an incoming Rock Slide hits first, which Camerup dodges while Growlithe is taxed out to half her life. So somehow, my Camerup goes before Growlithe, and my responding Rock Slide takes out the Anorith and half of the Araquanid's health and its turn. Unfortunately, Fire Fang finds its 5% mischance for the second time this episode. Next from Shelly is Heather. Sorry, Yan Mega. Yeah, she nicknames her Pokemon with her friends' names. Now comes a misplay. Rock Slide was a superior choice at this moment, hitting weakness on Araquanid and double weakness on Yan Mega. But I chose Lava Plume instead for the increased damage from the field while Growlithe just tries to bite something. Well, she won't bite anything this time, because that Yanmega was faster and hits Air Cutter, chopping Growlithe down. Camerupt survives, and here's where the misplay kills me. Camerupt would have knocked out the spider since it did about half on the first slide, and with any luck, the quad weakness on the Dragonfly would have also killed, especially with Hail. Instead, our Aquanid survives to Bubble Beam my camel, and I lose again. Shelly's fight is always like this. On the third try, despite the attack drop, I decide to have Frog use Smackdown on the Masquerade since it's double weak to Rock. It sucks that he'll still be weak to the Energy Ball, but if he can kill the Masquerade that would be a boon. But there have apparently been some real wild speed ties in this fight, because Krikatoon goes after the Prankster Rain and lowers both of their special attack with Struggle Bug. I think that the Rock attack will kill the Flyer now, but it still hangs on. But thanks to the special attack reduction, Energy Ball no longer kills Frog. I know that a follow-up Struggle Bug will hit both and kill the Masquerade this time, while a Water Pulse should extinguish the Firefly. I'm honestly surprised I didn't see the Confuse Ray there again, as Frog goes first and douses Illumis. Masquerade and Krikatoon ditto Struggle Bug, leaving only Krikatoon standing. In come Zeb, Anorith, and Yen Mega all at once. With Anorith protected, Zeb is going to go for the Flying-type, PLEASE DO SOMETHING THIS TIME! 
Even though he gets hit by the rock slide, he finally does, clipping the Yen Mega by most of its health, helped by Struggle Bug. Krikatoon is hit by two of its weaknesses and faints. Time to head for Scorched Earth again, as Zeb tries to take out the Yen Mega, but another speed tie occurs and even though Zeb Striker can survive a rock slide, he gets Giga Drain too. Fortunately, the hail is falling. Camera up is back to do what he does best. Rock Slide was probably a more apt move for this exact moment, but removing her forestry benefits is important. Vanillish never has to endure Camera Up's Lava Plume, as Yen Mega drains the last of his HP. Then finally, a sick reprisal of the last fight sees a missed Rock Slide from Anorith, letting me Lava Plume with impunity, decimating her entire side. Now it's a two-on-two, -two, my Fire Types versus her Spider and final Pokémon, Volbeat, confirming that her brother really is the Azalea Town Gym Leader. Since Araquanid is by far the biggest problem of her side, I go for Rock Slide, and since Vanillish was knocked out last turn, Retaliate is online. Volbeat hits with a minimal struggle bug, which lowers special attack uselessly now. My two attacks land on the spider and almost kill it, but it lives to one-shot my Growlithe. This seems really bad, but the saving grace of this is that Araquanid, for being such a menace to my burning strategy, is really slow. Slow enough that, while Volbeat survives thanks to Moonlight, I rock slide the only threat out of the fight, as the burning field and the hail nearly end it right then and there. There is nothing Bugsy can do to curtail the carbonizing camel. So now you see what a gym battle in Reborn aims to look like. This fight never gets easier, no matter how much I rework it, because the type coverage she has is so ridiculous. It's incredible too how this fight still had one NFE in it. If that was an Armaldo instead, this fight would probably be insane. For my part, I played this as best as I could, though the trade-offs between Fire and Rock Slide kept screwing me. I knew that I needed a run where I didn't get horrendously unlucky with double confused turns, double flinches, or missing attacks. Once that run came, I knew I could win, but you saw at the end how close it came. If Growlithe had to fire fang the Araquanid instead of Camera being alive, then it's possible I would have lost. No matter what, this is a brutal fight. The first real crushing roadblock of Reborn. You can skip the Kling Clang in the Tsarina, and the Pulse fights aren't full houses, but this one stands right in your path and gives no quarter. It will test you. For defeating the defeatist but reassuring Shelly, we obtain the Cocoon Badge, reaching level 40 cap, as well as getting the TM for Struggle Bug. That gives Krikatoon the ability to put False Swipe and Struggle Bug on rotation, so the Fury can live on. Most importantly, we can now use Rock Smash outside of battle something that is going to unlock a lot of new exploration. Unfortunately, some bad timing is going to put someone in harm's way, and we'll have to call on the good doctor ourselves. But you'll be forgiven if you feel that this is a bad omen.